Story 7, Part 1 of Sea Stories My First Voyage The fourteenth day of August was the day, fixed upon for the sailing of the Brig Pilgrim, on her voyage from Boston, round Cape Horn, to the western coast of North America. As she was to get under way early in the afternoon, I made my appearance on board at twelve o'clock, in full sea rig, and with my chest, containing an outfit for a two or three years' voyage, which I had undertaken from a determination to cure, if possible, by an entire change of life, and by a long absence from books and study, a weakness of the eyes which had obliged me to give up my pursuits, and which no medical aid seemed likely to cure. The change from the tight dress coat, silk cap, and kid gloves of an undergraduate at Cambridge, to the loose duck trousers, checked shirt, and tarpaulin hat of a sailor, though somewhat of a transformation, was soon made, and I supposed that I should pass very well for a jack tar. But it is impossible to deceive the practiced eye in these matters, and while I supposed myself to be looking as salt as Neptune himself, I was no doubt known for a landsman by every one on board as soon as I hove in sight. A sailor has a peculiar cut to his clothes, and a way of wearing them which a green hand can never get. The trousers, tight round the hips, and thence hanging long and loose round the feet, a superabundance of checked shirt, a low-crowned, well-varnished black hat, worn on the back of the head, with half a fathom of black ribbon hanging over the left eye, and a peculiar tie to the black silk neckerchief with sundry other minutiae, are signs the want of which betrayed the beginner at once. Besides the points in my dress which were out of the way, doubtless my complexion and hands were enough to distinguish me from the regular salt, who, with a sunburnt cheek, wide step, and rolling gait, swings his broad and toughened hands athwart ships, half open, as though just ready to grasp a rope. With all my imperfections on my head, I joined the crew, and we hauled out into the stream, and came to anchor for the night. The next day we were employed in preparations for sea, reeving studding sail gear, crossing royal yards, putting on chafing gear, and taking on board our powder. On the following night I stood my first watch. I remained awake nearly all the first part of the night, from fear that I might not hear when I was called, and when I went on deck, so great were my ideas of the importance of my trust, that I walked regularly fore and aft the whole length of the vessel, looking out over the bows and taffrail at each turn, and was not a little surprised at the coolness of the old salt whom I called to take my place in stowing himself snugly away under the longboat for a nap. That was a sufficient lookout, he thought, for a fine night at anchor in a safe harbor. The next morning was Saturday, and a breeze having sprung up from the southward, we took a pilot on board, hove up our anchor, and began beating down the bay. I took leave of those of my friends who came to see me off, and had barely opportunity to take a last look at the city and well-known objects, as no time is allowed on board ship for sentiment. As we drew down into the lower harbor, we found the wind ahead in the bay, and we were obliged to come to anchor in the roads. We remained there through the day and a part of the night. My watch began at eleven o'clock at night, and I received orders to call the captain if the wind came out from the westward. About midnight the wind became fair, and having called the captain, I was ordered to call all hands. How I accomplished this I do not know, but I am quite sure that I did not give the true hoarse boatswain call of, All hands! Up anchor ahoy! In a short time every one was in motion, the sails loosed, the yards braced, and we began to heave up the anchor which was our last hold upon Yankee land. I could take but little part in these preparations. My little knowledge of a vessel was all at fault. Unintelligible orders were so rapidly given and so immediately executed. There was such a hurrying about, and such an intermingling of strange cries and strange actions, that I was completely bewildered. 
there is not so helpless and pitiable an object in the world as a landsman beginning a sailor's life. At length those peculiar long-drawn sounds, which denote that the crew are heaving at the windlass, began, and in a few moments we were under way. The noise of the water thrown from the bows began to be heard. The vessel leaned over from the damp night breeze, and rolled with a heavy ground swell, and we had actually begun our long, long journey. This was literally bidding good night to my native land. The first day we passed at sea was the Sabbath. As we were just from port, and there was a great deal to be done on board, we were kept at work all day, and at night the watches were set, and everything put into sea order. When we were called aft to be divided into watches, I had a good specimen of the manner of a sea captain. After the division had been made, he gave a short characteristic speech, walking the quarter-deck with a cigar in his mouth, and dropping the words out between the puffs. Now, my men, we have begun a long voyage. If we get along well together, we shall have a comfortable time. If we don't, we shall have hell afloat. All you've got to do is obey your orders and do your duty like men. Then you'll fare well enough. If you don't, you'll fare hard enough, I can tell you. If we pull together, you'll find me a clever fellow. If we don't, you'll find me a bloody rascal. That's all I've got to say. Go below the larboard watch. I, being in the starboard, or second mate's watch, had the opportunity of keeping the first watch at sea. S., a young man, making like myself his first voyage, was in the same watch, and as he was the son of a professional man, and had been in a counting-room in Boston, we found that we had many friends and topics in common. We talked these matters over, Boston, what our friends were probably doing, our voyage, etc., until he went to take his turn at the lookout, and left me to myself. I now had a fine time for reflection. I felt, for the first time, the perfect silence of the sea. The officer was walking the quarter-deck, where I had no right to go. One or two men were talking on the forecastle, whom I had little inclination to join, so that I was left open to the full impression of everything about me. However much I was affected by the beauty of the sea, the bright stars, and the clouds driven swiftly over them, I could not but remember that I was separating myself from all the social and intellectual enjoyments of life. Yet, strange as it may seem, I did then and afterward take pleasure in these reflections, hoping by them to prevent my becoming insensible to the value of what I was leaving. But all my dreams were soon put to flight by an order from the officer to trim the yards, as the wind was getting ahead and I could plainly see by the looks the sailors occasionally cast to the windward, and by the dark clouds that were fast coming up, that we had bad weather to prepare for, and had heard the captain say that he expected to be in the Gulf Stream by twelve o'clock. In a few minutes eight bells were struck, the watch called, and we went below. I now began to feel the first discomforts of a sailor's life. The steerage in which I lived was filled with coils of rigging, spare sails, old junk, and ship stores which had not been stowed away. Moreover, there had been no berths built for us to sleep in, and we were not allowed to drive nails to hang our clothes upon. The sea, too, had risen, and the vessel was rolling heavily, and everything was pitched about in grand confusion. There was a complete hurrah's nest, as the sailors say, everything on top and nothing at hand. A large hawser had been coiled away upon my chest. My hats, boots, mattress, and blankets had all fetched away and gone over leeward, and were all jammed and broken under the boxes and coils of rigging. To crown all, we were allowed no light to find anything with, and I was just beginning to feel strong symptoms of seasickness and that listlessness and inactivity which accompany it. Giving up all attempt to collect my things together, I lay down upon the sails, expecting every moment to hear the cry of all hands ahoy, which the approaching storm would soon make necessary. 
I shortly heard the raindrops falling on deck, thick and fast, and the watch evidently had their hands full of work, for I could hear the loud and repeated orders of the mate, the trampling of feet, the creaking of blocks, and all the accompaniments of a coming storm. In a few minutes the slide of the hatch was thrown back, which let down the noise and tumult of the deck still louder. The loud cry of, "'All hands ahoy! Tumble up here and take in sail!' saluted our ears, and the hatch was quickly shut again. When I got upon deck, a new scene and a new experience was before me. The little brig was close-hauled upon the wind, and lying over, as it then seemed to me, nearly upon her beam ends. The heavy head sea was beating against her bows, with the noise and force almost of a sledge-hammer, and flying over the deck, drenching us completely through. The topsail halyards had been let go, and the great sails were filling out and backing against the masts with a noise like thunder. The wind was whistling through the rigging, loose ropes flying about, loud and to me unintelligible orders constantly given and rapidly executed, and the sailors singing out at the ropes in their hoarse and peculiar strains. In addition to all this, I had not got my sea legs on, was dreadfully sick, with hardly strength enough to hold on to anything, and it was pitch dark. This was my state when I was ordered aloft for the first time to reef topsails. How I got along I cannot now remember. I laid out on the yards and held on with all my strength. I could not have been of much service, for I remember having been sick several times before I left the topsail yard. Soon all was snug aloft, and we were again allowed to go below. This I did not consider much of a favor, for the confusion of everything below, and the inexpressible sickening smell caused by the shaking up of the bilge water in the hold, made the steerage but an indifferent refuge from the cold, wet decks. I had often read of the nautical experiences of others, but I felt as though there could be none worse than mine, for in addition to every other evil I could not but remember that this was only the first night of a two years' voyage. When we were on deck we were not much better off for we were continually ordered about by the officer, who said that it was good for us to be in motion. Yet anything was better than the horrible state of things below. I remember very well going to the hatchway and putting my head down when I was oppressed by nausea, and always being relieved immediately. It was as good as an emetic. This state of things continued for two days. Wednesday, August 20th. We had the watch on deck from four till eight this morning. When we came on deck at four o'clock, we found things much changed for the better. The sea and wind had gone down, and the stars were out bright. I experienced a corresponding change in my feelings, yet continued extremely weak from my sickness. I stood in the waist on the weather side, watching the gradual breaking of the day and the first streaks of the early light. Much has been said of the sunrise at sea, but it will not compare with the sunrise on shore. It wants the accompaniments of the songs of birds, the awakening hum of men, and the glancing of the first beams upon trees, hills, spires, and housetops, to give it life and spirit. But though the actual rise of the sun at sea is not so beautiful, yet nothing will compare with the early breaking of day upon the wide ocean. There is something in the first gray streaks stretching along the eastern horizon, and throwing an indistinct light upon the face of the deep, which combines with the boundlessness and unknown depth of the sea round you, and gives one a feeling of loneliness, of dread, and of melancholy foreboding, which nothing else in nature can give. This gradually passes away, as the light grows brighter, and when the sun comes up, the ordinary monotonous sea day begins. From such reflections as these, I was aroused by the order from the officer. Forward there, rig the head pump. I found that no time was allowed for daydreaming, but that we must turn to at the first light. 
having called up the idlers namely carpenter cook steward etc and rigged the pump we commenced washing down the decks this operation which is performed every morning at sea takes nearly two hours and i had hardly strength enough to get through it after we had finished swabbed down and coiled up the rigging I sat down on the spars, waiting for seven bells, which was the sign for breakfast. The officer, seeing my lazy posture, ordered me to slush the mainmast from the royal masthead down. The vessel was then rolling a little, so that I felt tempted to tell him that I had rather wait till after breakfast, but I knew that I must take the bull by the horns, and that if I showed any sign of want of spirit or of backwardness that I should be ruined at once so I took my bucket of grease and climbed up to the royal masthead. Here the rocking of the vessel, which increases the higher you go from the foot of the mast, which is the fulcrum of the lever, and the smell of the grease, which offended my fastidious senses, upset my stomach again, and I was not a little rejoiced when I got upon the comparative terra firma of the deck. In a few minutes seven bells were struck, the log hove, the watch called, and we went to breakfast. Here I cannot but remember the advice of the cook, a simple-hearted African. Now, said he, my lad, you are well cleaned out. You haven't got a drop of your longshore swash aboard of you. You must begin on a new tack, pitch all your sweetmeats overboard, and turn to upon good hearty salt beef and sea bread, and I'll promise you you'll have your ribs well sheathed, and be as hearty as any of em before you are up to the horn. This would be good advice to give passengers when they speak of the little niceties which they have laid in in case of seasickness. I cannot describe the change which half a pound of cold salt beef and a biscuit or two produced in me. I was a new being. We had a watch below until noon, so that I had some time to myself, and getting a huge piece of strong cold salt beef from the cook, I kept gnawing upon it until twelve o'clock. When we went on deck, I felt somewhat like a man, and could begin to learn my sea duty with considerable spirit. At about two o'clock we heard the loud cry of, Sail ho! from aloft, and soon saw two sails to windward, going directly athwart our hawse. This was the first time that I had seen a sail at sea. I thought then, and have always since, that it exceeds every other sight in interest and beauty. They passed to leeward of us, and out of hailing distance, but the captain could read the names on their sterns with the glass. They were the ship Helen Marr of New York, and the brig Mermaid of Boston. They were both steering westward, and were bound in for our dear native land. Thursday, August 21st. This day the sun rose clear, we had a fine wind, and everything was bright and cheerful. I had now got my sea legs on, and was beginning to enter upon the regular duties of a sea life. About six bells, that is three o'clock p.m., we saw a sail on our larboard bow. I was very anxious, like every new sailor, to speak her. She came down to us, backed her main topsail, and the two vessels stood head on, bowing and curvetting at each other like a couple of war-horses reined in by their riders. It was the first vessel that I had seen near, and I was surprised to find how much she rolled and pitched in so quiet a sea. She plunged her head into the sea, and then, her stern settling gradually down, her huge bows rose up, showing the bright copper, and her stern and breast-hooks dripping like old Neptune's locks with the brine. Her decks were filled with passengers, who had come up at the cry of Sail Ho, and who, by their dress and features, appeared to be Swiss and French emigrants. She hailed us in French, but receiving no answer she tried us in English. She was the ship La Carolina from Havre for New York. We desired her to report the brig Pilgrim from Boston for the northwest coast of America five days out. She then filled away and left us to plow on through our waste of waters. This day ended pleasantly. We had got into regular and comfortable weather, 
and into that routine of sea life which is only broken by a storm, a sail, or the sight of land. As we had now a long spell of fine weather without any incident to break the monotony of our lives, there can be no better place to describe the duties, regulations, and customs of an American merchantman, of which ours was a fair specimen. The captain, in the first place, is Lord Paramount. He stands no watch, comes and goes when he pleases, and is accountable to no one, and must be obeyed in everything, without a question, even from his chief officer. He has the power to turn his officers off duty, and even to break them and make them do duty as sailors in the forecastle. Where there are no passengers and no supercargo, as in our vessel, he has no companion but his own dignity, and no pleasures, unless he differs from most of his kind, but the consciousness of possessing supreme power, and, occasionally, the exercise of it. The Prime Minister, the official organ, and the active and superintending officer is the chief mate. He is first lieutenant, boatswain, sailing master, and quartermaster. The captain tells him what he wishes to have done, and leaves to him the care of overseeing, of allotting the work, and also the responsibility of its being well done. The mate, as he is always called, par excellence, also keeps the log-book, for which he is responsible to the owners and insurers, and has the charge of the stowage, safe-keeping, and delivery of the cargo. He is also, ex officio, the wit of the crew, for the captain does not condescend to joke with the men, and the second mate no one cares for, so that when the mate thinks fit to entertain the people with a coarse joke or a little practical wit, every one feels bound to laugh. The second mate's is proverbially a dog's berth. He is neither officer nor man. The men do not respect him as an officer, and he is obliged to go aloft, to reef and furl the top sails, and to put his hands into the tar and slush with the rest. The crew call him the sailor's waiter, as he has to furnish them with spun yarn, marlin, and all the other stuffs that they need in their work, and has charge of the boatswain's locker, which includes serving boards, marlin spikes, etc. He is expected to maintain his dignity and to enforce obedience, and still is kept at a great distance from the mate, and obliged to work with the crew. He is one to whom little is given, and of whom much is required. His wages are usually double those of a common sailor, and he eats and sleeps in the cabin, but he is obliged to be on deck nearly all his time, and eats at the second table, that is, makes a meal out of what the captain and chief mate leave. The steward is the captain's servant, and has charge of the pantry, from which every one, even the mate himself, is excluded. These distinctions usually find him an enemy in the mate, who does not like to have any one on board who is not entirely under his control. The crew do not consider him as one of their number, so he is left to the mercy of the captain. The cook is the patron of the crew, and those who are in his favor can get their wet mittens and stockings dried, or light their pipes at the galley in the night watch. These two worthies, together with the carpenter and sail-maker, if there be one, stand no watch, but being employed all day, are allowed to sleep in at night, unless all hands are called. The crew are divided into two divisions, as equally as may be, called the watches. Of these the chief mate commands the larboard, and the second mate the starboard. They divide the time between them, being on and off duty, or, as it is called, on deck and below, every other four hours. If, for instance, the chief mate with the larboard watch have the first night watch from eight to twelve, at the end of the four hours the starboard watch is called, and the second mate takes the deck, while the larboard watch and the first mate go below until four in the morning, when they come on deck again and remain until eight, having what is called the morning watch as they will have been on deck eight hours out of the twelve, while those who had the middle watch from twelve to four will only have been up four hours, they have what is called a forenoon watch below, 
that is from 8 a.m. till 12 a.m. In a man of war, and in some merchantmen, this alternation of watches is kept up throughout the 24 hours. But our ship, like most merchantmen, had all hands from 12 o'clock to dark, except in bad weather when we had watch and watch. An explanation of the dog watches may perhaps be of use to one who has never been at sea. They are to shift the watches each night, so that the same watch need not be on deck at the same hours. In order to effect this, the watch from 4 to 8 a.m. is divided into two half or dog watches, one from 4 to 6 and the other from 6 to 8. By this means they divide the 24 hours into seven watches instead of six, and thus shift the hours every night. As the dog watches come during twilight, after the day's work is done, and before the night watch is set, they are the watches in which everybody is on deck. The captain is up, walking on the weather side of the quarter deck, the chief mate on the lee side, and the second mate about the weather gangway. The steward has finished his work in the cabin, and has come up to smoke his pipe with the cook in the galley. The crew are sitting on the windlass, or lying on the forecastle, smoking, singing, or telling long yarns. At eight o'clock, eight bells are struck, the log is hove, the watch set, the wheel relieved, the galley shut up, and the other watch goes below. The morning commences with the watch on deck turning to at daybreak, and washing down, scrubbing, and swabbing the decks. This, together with filling the scuttled butt with fresh water, and coiling up the rigging, usually occupies the time until seven bells, half after seven, when all hands get breakfast. At eight the day's work begins, and lasts until sundown, with the exception of an hour for dinner. Before I end my explanations, it may be well to define a day's work, and to correct a mistake prevalent among landsmen about a sailor's life. Nothing is more common than to hear people say, Are not sailors very idle at sea? What can they find to do? This is a very natural mistake, and being very frequently made, it is one which every sailor feels interested in having corrected. In the first place, then, the discipline of the ship requires every man to be at work upon something when he is on deck, except at night and on Sundays. Except at these times, you will never see a man on board a well-ordered vessel standing idle on deck, sitting down or leaning over the side. It is the officer's duty to keep everyone at work, even if there is nothing to be done but to scrape the rust from the cabin cables. In no state prison are the convicts more regularly set to work, and more closely watched. No conversation is allowed among the crew at their duty, and though they frequently do talk when aloft or when near one another, yet they always stop when an officer is nigh. With regard to the work upon which the men are put, it is a matter which probably would not be understood by one who has not been at sea. When I first left port, and found that we were kept regularly employed for a week or two, I supposed that we were getting the vessel into sea trim, and that it would soon be over, and we should have nothing to do but to sail the ship. But I found that it continued so for two years, and at the end of the two years there was as much to be done as ever. As has often been said, a ship is like a lady's watch, always out of repair, when first leaving port, studding sail gear is to be rove, all the running rigging to be examined, that which is unfit for use to be got down, and new rigging rove in its place. Then the standing rigging is to be overhauled, replaced, and repaired in a thousand different ways, and wherever any of the numberless ropes or the yards are chafing or wearing upon it, their chafing gear, as it is called, must be put on. This chafing gear consists of worming, parceling, roundings, battens, and service of all kinds, both rope yarns, spun yarn, marlin, and seizing stuffs. Taking off, putting on, and mending the chafing gear alone upon a vessel 
would find constant employment for two or three men during working hours for a whole voyage. The next point to be considered is that all the small stuffs which are used on board a ship, such as spun yarn, marlin, seizing stuff, etc., are made on board. The owners of a vessel buy up incredible quantities of old junk, which the sailors unlay after drawing out the yarns, knot them together, and roll them up in balls. These rope yarns are constantly used for various purposes, but the greater part is manufactured into spun yarn. For this purpose, every vessel is furnished with a spun yarn winch, which is very simple, consisting of a wheel and spindle. This may be heard constantly going on deck in pleasant weather, and we had employment during a great part of the time for three hands in drawing and knotting yarns and making spun yarn. End of Story 7, Part 1